Welcome to the Louvre. This is Vincent Price, about to share with you some of the world's great art treasures. Kings and emperors of France spent huge fortunes acquiring masterpieces for the Louvre. Today, people from all walks of life get pleasure from them, for truly great art speaks to us all. Consider our first painting, Madonna of the Angels by Cimabue. To see the beauty in this 700-year-old work, you need only let your eye rest on the calm, tender expression of the Madonna as she holds the Christ child in her lap. Notice how the beaten gold of the background creates a feeling of heavenly majesty, how the pale, delicate flesh tones of the angels add to their unearthly quality. In the 13th century, when Cimabue painted this Madonna, figures were intended to be symbols rather than real people and were set against backgrounds of beaten gold instead of in natural settings. But Cimabue was interested in something new, the real look of things. We see here more than Mary. The tenderness with which she holds the child reminds us of motherhood itself. Now let's move to the second picture. In An Old Man and His Grandson by Gil and Dio, we see a remarkable contrast. Instead of a religious subject, here is a glowing scene of daily life, an old man smiling at his trusting grandchild. Gil and Dio lived about 200 years after Cimabue. He was what we call a realistic painter, happy to paint the familiar faces about him as they were, complete with wrinkles, warts, and coils of golden hair. Gilandayo has captured for all time a warm and universal human moment. In picture three, we come upon the crucifixion as seen through the eyes of Mantegna, a painter from the north of Italy. In this powerful and dramatic picture, the genius of a master artist has brought to life a great moment from the Bible, even more vividly, perhaps, than we had ever imagined it. Mantegna makes us feel that we ourselves are suddenly confronted by the deeply moving scene. Space seems to rush away from us like wind down a long hall. The impact is tremendous. Please go to number four. Here in a garden, a mother romps with her child. Who can deny the beauty, the divine peace of this golden scene? La Belle Jardiniere, the pretty gardener, was painted by one of the great masters of the Renaissance, Raphael. The ideal beauty and harmony we see here, no warts, no wrinkles, no violent movement, is the mark of what we call classical art. The lovely gardener with her perfectly oval face is the Madonna watching over the Redeemer. Our fifth picture, Pastoral Concert, is a splendid work by a Renaissance artist from Venice, Giorgione. He led the way for modern painting. He showed how rich and luminous color could be. Notice the warm colors and flesh tones, the brilliant clothes of the men. No painter had ever been able to capture such colors before. Now we come to number six. In this scene of Christ's entombment, another famous Venetian painter, Titian, expresses his feeling for intense drama. The picture is marvelously balanced. See how the two groups of holy men and women frame Christ's body. Their faces are stamped with gravity, but not despair. The figure holding the legs is thought to be a portrait of Titian himself. Let us move to picture seven. Here is another Calvary scene, this time by Veronese. He usually painted joyous scenes, but we see here that he also knew how to depict the cries of profound sorrow. The picture is crowded on the left, disturbing our sense of balance. An ominous blanket of clouds cuts across the sky. The tall silhouette in yellow, bowed with endless tears, seems to announce the destiny of a blind humanity. In number eight, we arrive at the most celebrated painting in the world, The Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. Here in the face of this young Florentine woman is an image of humanity raised to an ideal state. The expression around the eyes and the famous smile are as elusive as the distant landscape in the background and as mysterious as the human soul itself. Leonardo spent four years on this painting and into it was put the skill of perhaps the most universal genius of all time. Now please turn the slide card over. Here we have come to picture nine. We are not sure who the king is in this picture. That is the reason for the question mark after the title. It is a typical work by El Greco, a strange painter from Crete who spent most of his life in Spain. 
See how its haunted feeling and distorted shapes differ from the calm perfection of the Mona Lisa? Art we see can be made up of many differing attitudes towards life. Consider our next painting, picture 10. The clubfoot is a fine example of Spanish realism. Ribera was sympathetic to human misery and often made beggars and cripples his subjects, but he does not destroy human dignity. The note in the boy's hand is an appeal for charity, yet he carries his crutch as proudly as a nobleman carries his bright sword. Here in number 11, we arrive at another contrast in feeling. Instead of a very human cripple, we find ourselves gazing at a scene right out of Greek mythology. It is a work typical of Poussin, the greatest French painter of the 17th century. He painted in an elegant but robust classical style and loved to bring the ancient gods and goddesses to life. Here Apollo is attended by Cupids and one of the muses as he orders that a poet be crowned. Now let us come back to Earth in picture 12. Rubens preferred to paint people rather than gods. Notice how this portrait of Rubens' second wife and two of their children seems to be balanced on a line from the bottom left to top right corner. Observe the rich contrasts of color and light. In number 13, we see a portrait of King Charles I of England, later beheaded in a successful rebellion led by Oliver Cromwell. It was painted by the Flemish artist Van Dyck, the artist is captured in the proud posture of the king, the arrogance which was to lead to his overthrow and execution. In slide 14, we move to a little picture of the Virgin by Jan van Eyck, in which everything is rendered with jewel-like exactness. This painting is filled with symbols and hidden meanings. The open room represents the temple of Jerusalem and the town in the distance, the heavenly Jerusalem. The intricate carvings on the columns are Bible scenes.